we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Panel to the Peoples Advancing Mathematics Education Panel. Uh, we're incredibly excited to have you as well as our incredible panelists joining us this afternoon, at least in my time zone. Um, my name is Maya and I'm an incoming freshman at Princeton University planning on studying mathematics and I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, our panelists today um, are as follows. Professor Pamela Harris, uh, Associate Professor of Mathematics at Williams College, author of numerous research articles and co-founder of Latvisms.org, a platform that features the contributions of Latin and Hispanic scholars in the mathematical sciences. And then we have um, Ms. Lori Huff, a District Math Coordinator for Fayetteville Public Schools in Fayetteville, Arkansas, an educator for 36 years, 28 years class in, in the classroom and eight years in math leadership, and a member of the board of directors for NCTM and the executive board of ACTM. Uh, we also have Mr. Philip Legner, founder of, awarding, of award winning EdTech platform Mathathon, including adaptive and explorable textbooks for a variety of courses and former software engineer at Google. And we have finally Professor Potion Lo, uh, Associate Professor of Mathematics at Carnegie Mellon University, a social entre entrepreneur, a US International Mathematical Olympiad team coach and founder of the free personalized learning platform XP. Um, while we are eager to um, hear the insights of our panelists, um, we have to go over a few housekeeping items before we start the panel. Uh, first, we ask that you stay muted until the Q&A. You may enter any questions you have into the chat and we'll try our best to um, address them um, during the Q&A after our questions have been asked. Um, we'll be posting links and other relevant information in the chat as well, so be on the lookout for those. To our panelists, our goal here is to have a discussion rather than an interview, so we would ask that you do not feel too restrained uh, by time restrictions. Um, our audience would likely gain more from a more nuanced discussion of a few questions rather than a cursory address of many questions. So feel free to jump in and respond to other panelists' insights. We want to add as much depth and dimension to the panel as possible. And with that, we want to thank our panelists and audience again for joining us today and proceed with questions. Okay, so our first question is just um, to give a brief interview of, or brief synopsis of your involvement in mathematics education and why you chose to work in the field. So we'll go in the order um, alphabetically by last name. So we'll start with um, Professor Harris, then um, Ms. Huff, and then Mr. Legner, and then Professor Lowe. All right, thank you so much for the invitation to be on the panel, it's an honor. So I wanted to start by mentioning that part of my undergraduate education was at Marquette University. And the motto there for students and for everyone there was be people for others. And it really resonated with me and really became really my life motto. I, I think about my passion for teaching and my love for math and it kind of just shaped a very natural career for me to become a math professor. Now I'm a PhD mathematician, I'm trained as an algebraic combinatorialist and so it's been recent work that I've been undertaking to work with mathematics education scholars on some professional development opportunities at the intersection of mathematics, mathematical inquiry and equity. And there's really two main reasons why I work in the field. So first off, being a woman of color, I feel like it is really important for me to reinforce the a student self identity as scientists. And so that's particularly important when I work with women and when I work with other, other underrepresented minority students. And really, secondly, I feel like a lot of the work that I've been undertaking um, in the recent past has been to highlight the contributions of other people. I don't believe in the, this is the only mathematician of color motto. There's so many of us, and I really want to work to bring visibility um, to, to the field and to just say, look, we're here, here's all the things that we're doing. And so that's why I co-founded Lati Sons with a group of my friends, which as you mentioned, really does work to feature the work of Latinx and Hispanic mathematicians. So I'm, I'm excited to have a conversation with everyone today. Awesome, thank you. 
Uh, I also want to thank you for this invitation. I love to discuss math at any 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 chance I get. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, my involvement with mathematics, I was have my training has come from you know a focus on elementary education. So my preparation is in elementary education, and. Um, you know, if you're prepared for elementary education, you're prepared to teach, facilitate the learning of every subject. But I always gravitated to mathematics. I loved teaching and learning mathematics, even when I was in, in school. And because I love solving problems, I love uh, working puzzles and, and playing games, all of that's mathematics. And those are things people enjoy. So when people say, I'm not a mathematician, I'm like, yes, you are, <laughs> because we enjoy those things. Um, and I was fortunate to have principals uh, in the schools that I taught in who embraced the, or accepted the concept of departmentalization. So I was able to focus a lot of my teaching in the areas of math and science. And I, I really appreciated having that opportunity. Uh, I've also, throughout my career, I just wanted to get involved in decision-making with mathematics. And so I served on state and district level math committees, task force, anything that dealt with developing the curriculum and supporting mathematics. I even was involved in reviewing and the statistical review of state testing items. So that was, and I enjoyed it. It was great, you know, looking at that. Um, in 20, you know, I was a math teacher, for, uh, I was a teacher, I'm a I've been in education for 36 years, 28 of those years was in uh, the classroom. But in 2012, I got to, the opportunity to become a math coach. Before then, I was influencing one class of 28 students each year, and I wanted to help in the teaching and learning of mathematics more, so that transition to being a math coach was great, and now I can have an influence on multiple classes of an average of 25 students, so just, just stretching out there more, so that's my background with the math education. Great. Um, I guess... Uh, my turn. Uh, thanks, Maya, for the invitation. It's uh, really great to be here and uh, talk to all of you. Um, I'm Philip. I uh, first got started in maths education while studying mathematics myself at university. We had an outreach project where university students went into local primary and secondary schools to run workshops for small groups of kids. And I did that uh, during uh, all my years at university and uh, noticed two things, uh, or three things, actually. One is that students didn't particularly enjoy mathematics, at least not initially. And what students thought mathematics is was very different from what I thought mathematics is. And, um, but I also saw that with the right activities and, and lessons and interactive games, puzzles and so on, you can quite easily change that perception and get uh, everyone excited about mathematics, no matter what their ability is. Um, so yeah, I, I've been working in outreach ever since leaving university, mostly as a spare time project. And uh, I, uh, a few years ago, I founded Mathigon, which is an uh, online textbook for high school mathematics. Awesome, thank you. Hello, I guess, I, I guess I'm next. So um, honestly, if I think about what I do, uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a strange person on this panel now because I, I do do math education. Although if you look me up on Google, most recently what I've spent most of my time on is trying to fight off COVID with, uh, with, with an app called Novid. But regardless, that, that sort of maybe it says a bit about my background or what I'm interested in. Ever since I was young, I think I really liked three things. One of them was helping people. I like somehow seeing people smile from something I've done to try to help them make their lives better. I always enjoyed challenge. I'd like to do things that were difficult, where it wasn't just doing a, a procedure I was told, but maybe even doing something that people didn't know how to do. And then the third one was, I really enjoyed creative analytical thinking, using creativity to invent some other solution or some other technique that maybe didn't exist before. And I actually found these all to come together through mathematics and math education, actually, in the end. Uh, I sort of went into this math education world from the, uh, from actually starting from the research side. I, I'm a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University, but because I'd been involved in math competitions when I was younger, at some point I, I became the national coach of the US International Math Olympiad team. And when that happened, it caused me to maybe 
change my viewpoint because before I was working in university and I was just working with students who were already, you know, already at that university level. But I started to think if I wanted to do something for the United States uh, in terms of coaching a math Olympian team, is there something I can do that tries to reach out to people at more scale? And that's when I started to think about scale. Because before that, actually, it's also very interesting. Another panelist commented about scale, right? At some point in my life, I found that maybe I could try to reach out to other scales. And that caused me to even ask why. So eventually why I chose to do the math education is I, I see it as a way of trying to help everybody have more tools to make better decisions for their own lives. That then goes back to my original principles of why of things I believe in. Um, and then eventually the question became, how can you do this at the biggest possible scale? And so in addition to what I used to do, which is go around giving talks in different cities, actually every weekend, um, that's what I did pre-COVID. I can't do that anymore. I've switched into other things like running a website called xp.com where people are able to look up um, Maybe Mathagon, you guys have some stuff which is pretty pretty advanced. We're, we're, we're trying to help people get pre-algebra and algebra one here, right? So, so we, we, we do that. I also started something called the Daily Challenge where I tried to teach people how to think in maybe a bit more creative mathematical ways. Um, and, and ultimately what I, what I also do now is um, because unfortunately I can't travel to give talks, I actually started to run a YouTube channel where, where I would go and show up an hour every day that was earlier. Now I show up an, every, an hour every week and answer random questions that anyone from the entire internet wants to ask about mathematics, primarily around the algebra or geometry levels. But I'll say that the, the whole thought process has been, how can I bring everything back to those core principles of helping people, of some things that are supposed to be very difficult and coming up with some other new solution? And if there's a way to do that at a, at a large scale, then I'm interested. And I think math education is one of these really things that, that fits the bill. And it's a, it's a real honor to be able to work alongside all the rest of the panelists towards this objective. That's wonderful. Awesome. Um, so yeah, it's great to see like the common threads between all the panelists and also the diversity um, in sort of outlook between all of you as well. Um, so as our second question, um, I wanna ask, um, in the same order to all of you, um, was there a moment in your own mathematics education that stands out to you as particularly influential, influential and what made that moment special? Yeah, so I, I had to narrow down because I think there was two that I had, but I wanted to share one, uh, but I'm happy to, to receive emails if somebody wants to hear the second. But for me, the first one was um, this idea that, uh, so first off, I am an accidental mathematician and what I mean by that is I didn't know that being a mathematician was a job or a career prospect or that like people got paid to do math. It's quite, uh, it's quite wild of an imagination for a child like me to be like, oh, you know what? Yeah, mathematician, that sounds like the job for me. Um, but it, it's even, I think, deeper than that because I didn't recognize that addition and multiplication were actually different operations until I started college. Um, and so for me, the first year of undergrad was really difficult, like being able to pick up my mathematical skills from where they were and build them up. But I was very lucky to start at a community college and then move on to, like I said, Marquette University, where I had people who encouraged me to just just take the next math class, you know, oh, take this one. Oh, next you have to take, you know, real analysis. And I remember in that real analysis class, I, uh, it was actually an independent study. And so I got to meet with the professor one-on-one -on -one, and we were very close. And during one of our meetings near the end of the semester, she said in passing, when you go to graduate school. And I, that moment changed my life because first off I was like, what is graduate school? Like, what are you saying? But it was less about the fact that she said that, you know, I was going to go to graduate school. It was what she said. She said, when you go, which implies that she already saw me there, that she already saw that I could be successful there and that I had a career as a mathematician if I wanted it. And so she saw me, she believed in me and there was no like, well, have you thought about graduate school? It wasn't a, if you go to graduate school, it literally was just like, when you go, here's what it'll be like and you'll do this and that and the other thing. And, and that comment, I mean, I carry it with me and every time I, I have some self doubt in my own abilities or the imposter syndrome comes out rearing its ugly head, I pull that back and I'm like, when, I do this next, you know? And so to me, that's been super special, special and very impactful um, moment in my career. Okay, I believe I'm next. <laughs> uh, I don't have a particular 
uh, moment that was influential for me, but I guess I was influenced by, I just had a great education, I guess, coming up in school and I had teachers who cared about me and teachers who established a relationship with me and seemed to believe in me, believe that I could do better and I could do more. But my favorite subjects were, subject was math and I loved working on math assignments. I would get that homework done first. <laughs> and so that's, that's just always been something that I've enjoyed. And my mother made a comment to me when I, when I went to college. She said, I don't know why you're not majoring in math. You know, you're good at mathematics. I don't know why that's not your major, but I, I, don't, I just said elementary education and teaching it all. And I, and I just love being able to share that belief in others in my field I, with students and teachers and just building people up. So that's been the thing that's been most influential with me, people showing that they care, building a relationship and just believing that a person can do better and can do more and letting them know that. Um, yeah, like Laurie, I don't have a single specific moment that inspired me to study mathematics or go, go into uh, science. Um, but I do remember that in uh, primary school, I got a report card from my teacher that said, Philip is good at everything except mathematics. Uh, and I, I just couldn't see the point of memorizing times tables or long division and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, when I was young, I was much more interested in arts, uh, uh, music, uh, architecture, these sort of um, subjects. But then as, as things got a bit more advanced in school and I saw how mathematics was really useful. I started doing maths Olympiad problems and that sort of stuff. Um, I really saw the beauty and art within mathematics. And uh, yeah, uh, that uh, inspired me to, to study it further. I think I, I'll also continue on this, uh, on this trend of somehow teachers having a lot of influence. I mean, I think a number of the stories that we've just heard are where teachers made a big impact uh, through whatever they chose to say. Um, and in my case, I think that the person who had the most strong influence on me was my PhD advisor, because I, I think, you know, um, Philip just brought up math Olympiads. And in indeed, when I was younger, I did a lot of these contests, but I didn't really know what was the point of math. Maybe I, I, I would I would be able to do problems if they were given to me and I would maybe take that as the challenge just to do those problems. But then the question would always be, what's the point? Why would we do this? Um, but my PhD advisor helped me to understand what was what we actually are trying to do. And that, that, that what we're trying to do is not even specific to math research. It's just specific. It's, it's more of we're trying to create we're trying to we're trying to figure out what is what is the good question to ask maybe i'll put it that way and that, this is this is actually a general thing it's not only math researchers that do this i think that all people who are always innovating uh, inside school districts inside schools as research professors we're always trying to find out what are the right questions to ask and there was one 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 moment i can remember very clearly it was that uh, at one point i was uh, doing some research together with my phd advisor and another collaborator and we were all sitting around and uh, one of the, the other collaborators said hey why don't we go and think about this problem and then my PhD advisor said, why? Why think about that problem? And the other person said, well, you know, we can try to figure out if we can solve it. And after we solve it, we can figure out, you know, why, whether anyone cares. And my PhD advisor said, no, that's the exact wrong way around. In business, you first find out what people want to buy, and then you make it. Actually, it was just that thought, right? Somehow, you know, I, I just said the word business, but actually it's also true with regard to research. And even though we're talking about the most like non-businesses of things like mathematics or mathematics research, the question, it, it stuck with me that, you know, if I'm going to think about anything, any problem, whether it be math or anything else, is it important? Will it help, will it help to contribute to, to something? And, and being able to see it through that lens of, oh yeah, you should understand how what you're working on would fit in if you achieved it. That was very, that was very powerful for, for me and it, and it has definitely influenced what I choose to do. It's wonderful hearing all these stories and how they all sort of connect back to the theme of interpersonal relationships in math. And that, that sort of reckons back to what math education should be centered on. So that's, that's a good thing to get into now. Um, but I guess in, in a sort of broad sense, kind of shifting towards like problems and innovation, um, what do you see or what do you believe to be the most uh, pressing, pressing issue in mathematics education today? And what do you see as sort of an ideal solution? Alrighty, so I'll get us started. Um, so I was thinking a lot about this and, and so I'm coming from the collegiate level. So I'm gonna answer from that perspective. And I think for me, one pressing issue is this continued stance that mathematics is apolitical. 
we continue to say that, right? Like mathematics is not about politics. It's, it's just like pure math and we're solving these abstract problems. Um, but the truth is that, you know, from gerrymandering or police profiling and so many other things, mathematics is being used to implement racist and discriminatory policies in this country. And we need to do something about that. Not addressing it is a huge mistake. And so there's times where people or companies, even corporations, they shouldn't be able to profit from these like black box algorithms without being able to put those algorithms and whatever accompanying data they're using and making that publicly available. And so how do, how do we solve this issue? I mean, we need to have these conversations. We need to have hard conversations about how mathematics is being used to implement these kinds of racist policies and discriminatory policies. Now, solution, talk about it, and then let's train more applied mathematicians to be able to, to check on this work. Great, okay, you. it's my turn. <laughs> well, at this time, I think one of the pressing issues is safety. Uh, teachers want to help students acquire knowledge. They want, uh, they don't want one of their students though to get sick or to die. And that's a real emotion that, that teachers are dealing with. Teachers don't want to get sick or die. And so that's something that's really upfront and immediate in the minds of teachers right now. Uh, teachers don't want to have to teach their students at a distance. They love to have that close relationship and connection with their students. Um, teachers like to make their students feel cared for and valued. We know that students won't be ready for learning academics until their social and emotional needs are met. They need to feel comfortable and safe. And this is the real talk right now. They need to feel comfortable and safe. Now, academically, we need to continue moving forward with connecting real mathematics lessons to our lives and the world. I have a slogan that I always use. I say, math is life. Because if you think about what you do on a daily basis, if you think about your life, there's a lot of math involved in it, if people really think about it. Uh, we need to bridge our learning to relevant events in our students' lives. This is an opportune time, even though COVID is horrible, this is an opportune time. It's the perfect time to weed the garden of numerous practices and routines that have been less effective. Those things that we have been waiting to stop doing, I, I, I encourage every district and every school to engage in ways of weeding that garden and getting less, let a, a rid of some of those practices and routines that have been just habit and that we've just kept on using. Those things that we have been wanting to stop doing, we need to go in and stop doing that. I'm gonna, I, I wanna encourage districts and schools to and get engaged in book studies and implementing change. This is the perfect time to, to start making those changes in our profession. And so I've listed and they've put in the chat some of the resources that I recommend getting in your district, your administrators, your teachers, all stakeholders involved in the Principles to Action book that was uh, published in 2014 but the recommendations, I believe, will last a lifetime. It has some effective changes in there that need to be made. The Taking Action series, there are three books, a K-5, 6-8, and a 9-12, and it just digs deeper into the mathematical teaching practices. Catalyzing Change series has a practical guide for all stakeholders to re-examine long-standing beliefs, practices, and policies that are impeding progress. There's a book called Strength-Based Teaching and Learning in Mathematics. It, it covers five teaching turnarounds for grades K through six. And it's talking about looking for the strengths in a person, not the weaknesses. Look for their strengths and build on that. Also, I hope people are aware of the NCTM 100 Days of Professional Learning that's going on. There are webinars that you can go back and listen to or register for upcoming webinars. And there've been a lot of conversation about what we're talking about tonight, uh, today. <laughs> <It is. laughs> and so just uh, take advantage of some of those webinars. And, and that's something that I've done in my educational career. I just, I love to continue learning, continue my education through conferences or webinars 
just engaging in the conversation. That's the first start. That's the first start to the solution is to start talking about it with others. Uh, okay, well, uh, thanks, Laurie. That's so, so much stuff to digest and so many links to click through uh, afterwards. So, yeah, I think there are obviously some really pressing issues in the short term for mathematics education, like how do we do remote learning in schools? How do we improve equity and accessibility in education? But I think in the long term, thinking about how mass education has changed through the last century, I think the biggest issue is that we're teaching students the wrong stuff. It's almost all about memorizing certain procedures or equations for passing standardized exam questions like the quadratic formula or trigonometric identities or integration rules. And this is one of the reasons why so many students uh, dislike mathematics. And it also means that what we teach is not particularly useful once you leave school. Uh, if you ever have to use these procedures, you could just get a computer to do it. So I think we should be teaching very different topics like data science, game theory, cryptography, non-Euclidean geometry or chaos theory. And we should be teaching very different skills like problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, curiosity uh, and teamwork. And I think that will make uh, learning not just much more fun for students, but it, would, uh, it, it also means that what you learn in school is actually going to be useful for your entire life. Mm, yeah, these are very interesting. Actually, it's it's very interesting to always be the last person to answer because uh, it puts all this color in. First of all, I want to say I completely agree with what Laurie Huff said about the most pressing issue today. In fact, I, I think that unfortunately, this is not a small issue. This is a huge issue because I'm also an educator. I have to go into the classroom. I'm thinking about is this going to be enough, <laughs> right? So, so I, I'm actually saying uh, this is a this is a this is an extreme issue we need to solve right now. Of how are we going to find a way to be able to have all of our children be educated? Notice I say the word educated, not just babysat. Uh, the purpose of school is not just a way so that parents can do their work while foisting the kids onto somebody else to babysit, right? I mean, we actually really need to find a way to bring education back. And to me, that's actually why I, I myself pivoted. I mean, when you, when, you, when you knew me from before, you knew me as somebody who primarily worked on math education. As um, in the middle of March, I actually turned almost all of my energy towards attempting to stop the spread of COVID. Because the way I saw this is that uh, for example, if we're going to reopen any schools, we actually need to have very, very strong ways to reduce the spread of COVID in the entire community. Actually, through the kinds of work that I've been doing lately by talking to schools, I've, I've, I've learned that, you know, if the approach is just have something in place so that as soon as COVID gets into the school, we, we respond, that's actually too late. Uh, I mean, it's actually not going to be reasonable for, for, for even the teachers. If, if the only thing that we have is the moment it gets in, then we deal, we get rid of, we, we isolate the people who are sick. So that's actually why a lot of the work that I've been working on is attempting to stop the spread of COVID in, in the community. Uh, that's a completely separate thing. That would be a different talk. But now, uh, now, if I wanted to say something else, which is maybe a bit more on the math education side, uh, yeah, I see somebody said this. Yes, school is in childcare. This is, this is absolutely the case because because now, um, I mean, we we have we have we have wonderful educators here as well, right? But now now what I want to say on the math education side, this is also relevant to the fact that COVID nineteen doesn't look like it's going to go away soon, and so um, I'm a little concerned that this period of uh, instability in the public education experience is going to last for quite a while, and in that sense, what we actually ideally need is we need to make sure that um, as many people as possible get interested in acquiring knowledge. And what I mean by this is because uh, I also teach remotely now too. And when you teach remotely, half the people have the cameras off. I don't actually know if they're there. I don't actually know if they're paying attention. And the sad thing is that the people who choose not to pay attention are actually losing out themselves. And what's going to happen is if you go and have this go on for a year and a half or maybe even two years, there will be this huge discrepancy between the people who decided to pay attention and the people who decided not to pay attention. And so I see that as a, a major issue, because then if we finally all get back together in two years, it's not the summer slide that we were talking about. It was the two year slide. It was the COVID slide. And that's going to create a vast amount of inequity. So some of the things that I was actually very interested in doing before I switched all my attention to trying to fight COVID was I was trying to find ways to have people 
understand mathematics as a as a fun thing again similar to what uh, what Laurie was talking about but maybe to to reach out through things like music videos uh, if, you, if you look at what we've done with xp.com we have a few things on our youtube channel but, but the things like music videos things to 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 kind of help people no matter who they are to identify with mathematics as something that they would care about now of course i'm saying this as somebody who works on research but and although i, I also totally agree with um, uh, with what was said about i think i think philip was saying something about you know what math really is i i also agree that math is really exciting really rich and i love to introduce that too but i also think it, there's a certain level of also helping everyone see that you know even the math that might not quite be what you're talking about is also pretty interesting right you don't have to only do a uh, non-euclidean geometry before you realize that mathematics is interesting and relevant to your life I'm not criticizing you. I also love teaching uh, non-Euclidean geometry. But the point is that we, we want to make sure we grab everyone in. And the reason why I say this is so important is because otherwise, we're really going to have a bifurcation of the post-COVID educational world. And we made sort of a segue uh, to this through our discussion here. But uh, our next question deals with um, online learning. So. With online learning becoming the new norm for students across the US, how do you see mathematics education being impacted or in what ways might teachers tailor their instruction to meet to better meet the needs of their students in these unique circumstances? One of the things that occurs to me, um, and I think as Professor Lowe was mentioning, you know, there's times where a student might not it's not about choice sometimes, right? Like, do you choose to have your camera off or do you choose to put it on? Do you choose to pay attention or not? And I think there's times that it's a little bit more nuanced than that. You know, we don't all have the same ability to be in a home office with very good stable internet connection. Um, you know, so if, if COVID had happened while I was a student, you know, I would have had siblings to take care of and meals to make and things to clean and, and things to put away in ways that maybe some of my peers wouldn't have. And so I think that there's, there's some adapting that educators, as educators, we need to make, right? And that must start with a conversation. Like, what are things that our students need? I think Lori pointed this out very well, right? You can't learn anything if your safety and your health is not there. And so, so I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna do this, right? We're, we're on uncharted waters at the moment, but I think reaching out to our students and really just making sure that, hey, are you okay first and foremost, um, it's, it's something that needs to happen before we start thinking about you know, how to teach non-Euclidean geometry or whatever these like really fun topics are, because if they're not well, expecting that they're gonna be able to learn deep and difficult mathematics is gonna be very, very unfruitful. And so we need to adapt and we need to figure out how to open those lines of communication. Well, and this is a, a great time. I mean, people who, those involved in the instruction right now, this is an opportune time to define that to find what works, to, to dig deep and, and try to see how to translate what they've been doing into the formats that we have to work in now. So uh, it's exciting if you, if you, you know, I had a, a, a realization, I guess, in late July, because I was really getting frustrated with the uncertainty that's coming up and the changes that have been made. And I was, you know, and everyone was like, let's get back to normal. Let's get back, let's get back. And, and the thought was, no, let's not go back. Let's not get back to normal. Let's create a new and better and improved normal. So yes, it's a struggle right now, finding out how to build that relationship with students, how to connect with students. But those who figure it out, you know, you're gonna be way ahead of the game. It's like uh, last year, we would, you would say a lot, we're preparing students for jobs that haven't been created. So we're preparing thinkers, we're preparing people who are flexible, who are able to make changes and, and take that learning to a new level. This is an opportune time for this. It's exciting to be in, for people who are engaged in this. I had someone telling me their, their, their daughter was starting um, her, her student teaching this semester and was like, what am I going to do? And I'm like, that's so exciting because she'll be able to teach others what's effective now. And, and we're just going to have to keep relying on each other. It has to be a community effort to propel us forward, but it can be done. And, and we need to stop worrying about going back to something. We need to 
create something new and move forward. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Laurie. Um, there are obviously many challenges and difficulties introduced by COVID, but we should also think um, about it as an opportunity to an extent. One is to um, explore education technology and how that can be used to help with teaching even in, in a year or so when everyone is back in a classroom. Um, I know that lots of teachers are for the first time using tools like GeoGebra or Desmos um, or Mathigon in the classroom and uh, are finding that really useful. And um, I, I also think that the shift away from a huge focus on standardized exams. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on everywhere in the US, but many countries in Europe, for example, have canceled exams that has given uh, teachers freedom to focus on some uh, other parts of mathematics and focus a bit more about on, on, on creativity and problem solving. Um, but uh, so from a technology point of view, I think you have to be very aware that sitting in front of a computer all day, uh, looking at either um, a video or multiple choice questions or something like that uh, can be pretty depressing for students. So you have to uh, spend even more effort on engagement and motivating students through real life applications or through doing physical things. I don't know, building uh, origami shapes or uh, or doing some uh, physically active uh, mathematics exercises. And, and there are lots of uh, cool examples and stories of that uh, on, on Twitter or Google, if you search. Um, and, and for companies like mine who are creating educational technology, I think you have to think a lot about equity and accessibility and how can you create content that students can use if they don't have a stable Wi-Fi connection or if they have an uh, operating system that's four years old. So uh, do, do everything you can to, uh, to make the content as widely uh, useful and accessible as possible. Yeah, I actually, I, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with the comments that, that have been said. And actually also thank you very much, Pamela, for bringing up this point that yes, it's definitely not a choice. And in fact, I, 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 sh I should not have said the word choice if I said the word choice. Um, this is actually something which is quite serious. And I also, I also agree that if I think about what's the, what's the big problem with, with the online education, it is actually not, of course, the, the conveyance of the material is difficult, but the management of all of the things that we used to do in person, those are gone. And, and so, so, for example, even though I teach at a university, the way that I teach usually actually involves quite a lot of interaction with students. And in fact, even the time before class or after class, these are quite magical moments where you are able to interact with individual students. That's when you actually can uh, sometimes provide some guidance in other ways. And I'm sure that in the classroom, this is an even, even greater, even greater part. So if I, if I was to think about what, um, what, 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 what is the biggest challenge right now uh, or, or what, to do, what to do with the, with, the, with the online learning? It would be finding ways to try to scale that type of interaction, that type of thing that used to be an in-person thing with just a student uh, into the online setting. Uh, I don't exactly know how to do that. Um, on the other hand, I should, I should say, if I'm thinking about what we should do and thinking of it as an opportunity, um, I, have, I have noticed that there are some people have been saying, you know, there is, a moment in our time when everyone is thinking about something called COVID. And if there is a way to kind of use the fact that there is a international emergency to bring all of the subjects to life to a certain degree, in the sense that, you know, if you're teaching something, uh, there might be a chance that it has some relationship to the war on COVID that we have as, as a world. It's not a bad thing to integrate that. If you're teaching about exponential functions, for example, well, there's something called exponential growth. And that's the reason why COVID is a problem. And if you're talking about probabilities, there's some way that you can weave that thing in. But why I just said this is because also, if I'm thinking about what we could try to do, if I, if I, if I was trying to help advise a, a, a public school or a community, it would almost be if part of the teaching was also ways to try to help the community be safer. Why I'm saying this is because um, we all want the world to return back to normal. And the interesting thing is that the public education system touches so many people that it actually provides an opportunity that we could possibly reach into a lot of families. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying here, by the way, is that you know, on the one side, people want schools to reopen so that everyone can go back to work. But on the other hand, if, if the school was also used to help to educate everyone on how best to behave to reduce the spread of the virus, that would not be a bad thing. 
So, I mean, I, I would hope that somehow during this time, especially if there is online education or offline education, if some parts of it can also try to go back through the households and try to have the people in the whole city maybe behave in ways that will reduce the spread of COVID, that will actually help to bring everyone back to normal sooner. And that's actually why some of the work that I've been doing now with, 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 the, with the Novid app, actually it's ironic. I started out just by saying, let's go and try to stop COVID. And I've gone full circle. I'm talking to schools. I used to talk to schools from the education side. Now I'm talking to schools from the COVID side. But the reason why I came back to talk to schools and the education system and school districts is because actually the easiest way, not easiest, but one way to impact a city scale is actually if we go with the school, if we work with the schools, because suddenly everyone has aligned incentives. And actually, education system can educate not just math, but it can also educate how to keep, uh, keep a city safe. Great. And those are all wonderful points to consider. Thank you, guys. Um, so our next question is, what do you think are the most pivotal factors contributing to a student's attitude towards mathematics? And how can these factors be modulated for the better? I think I'm going to say what Philip said a little bit ago. Um, you know, if, if mathematics tends to be very formulaic and just like here's some mechanics and just rogue memorization, it makes it really hard for anybody to fall in love with a subject when that's how it's being taught. Um, but I think there's also something else that that I guess I want to point out because I, I agree wholeheartedly that that does affect how somebody relates to the content of material. But something for me that was really difficult was never seeing anybody that looked like me in those kinds of jobs, right? Like I said, I, you know, I, I guess maybe I didn't say, but this was my second story about like pivotal moments in my life. Um, the first time I ever met in person, another Latina woman who had a math PhD was not until the year before I graduated with my PhD. And so I didn't know that people like me did math. And I was scared that in fact, maybe I was one of the only ones, if not the only one. So a lack of STEM role models can really have a negative impact on a student's attitude towards mathematics. And you know, what do we do about this? And so as educators, I always ask myself, you know, whose pictures are on the wall in your classroom? Whose pictures are in your office? Who's pictured on the hallway in your math department? Um, whose book do you assign? Who wrote the book? What's their story? Who do they feature in these books? Who do we hold up as the influential mathematicians of our time? Does it always happen to be the same kind of person? Are they always white? Are they always male? If, if that's the case, and at least that was the case for me growing up and still very much part of my day-to-day -day experience, then we can't wonder why some of us don't have a good experience with mathematics when we don't see ourselves in mathematics. And so I wanna just reiterate that who you feature in mathematics can be equated with who is valued in mathematical spaces. And so as educators, we need to do better. We need to diversify whose work we feature. We need to highlight those students, broad students and broad scientists so that they can feel seen so our students can feel seen, they can feel valued in these mathematical spaces. And I think this really starts changing the culture of mathematics for the better. And I hope that by changing that culture, then it changes the experience that our students are having in these classrooms, and then it'll change their attitude. So I think it starts with, with doing some, some visual work, right? Like highlighting the work of, of all kinds of mathematicians. I agree with Pamela. That's great information, great comment, and great things that people need to think about. And mine goes along with that same um, realization. Um, so during the conversation with a colleague, I, she made a powerful statement. She said, "You know, in addition to concerns about the pandemic, recent events highlighting unfair treatment and even the death of Black people has become a major topic of concern." for people of all races. And we're, we've seen that in our world. So understanding that we teach human beings first, then mathematics. We have to address the issues that relate to mathematics education. Lessons and concepts are best when there is a real connection to life, living and events that are relevant to students. Engaging students in study and solving problems relevant to school, their lives, their homes, community, 
That's what engages, what gets students involved. I never wanted a student to leave my class and not understand how concepts that we studied would be used in their future. I remember a lesson about finding the area of a circle. And I was like, oh, when will they need to find the area of a circle? When will that need to happen? And I was helping my niece move and one of the round tables if, <laughs> broke. And she said, oh, I need to find, I need to measure the, the area of that, that, that circle so I can get a glass cut. I was like, wow, great. Now I can go in and give a real application for this, for this knowledge. And I think students, if they know they'll, you know, you used to hear people say, students would say, when am I ever gonna use this? If a teacher can't explain when they will need that, when they will use that in life, if they're not connecting it to life, that's where the disconnect comes from. Students will just turn it off right then. You know, we have um, a saying in Arkansas that, start, that I started using in 2012. We said, student thinking matters most. So what your students think and how they think really matters. And that's really evident now. Uh, we're preparing students for jobs, remember, that haven't been created yet. So they have to be able to think about that learning and apply it in their lives. They have to be thinkers and make sense of their learning. Every student needs to know and be capable of learning and using mathematics. Uh, we have to be able to apply things in different situations and be flexible. So students need to see that math is not a confusing and difficult subject or practice or a way of life. Uh, they need to see math in every aspect of their lives. You know, the, the thing that gets me the most, and I, I have to get on my soapbox a little bit when it happens, <laughs> is when I'm out in the store shopping. Well, don't do that as much as I used to, but when I would be out in the community and people would say, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm, a, I'm the math, you know, district math coordinator. And they go, oh, I don't do math or I can't do math. And I'm like, well, you're shopping. That's math. Math is, you know, we wake up. What time did you wake up? How many hours did you sleep? I mean, there are simple ways that we can really make the, the learning real for students, and we need to stretch to do that. I, to be honest, I don't think I have a lot to uh, add beyond what Pamela and Laurie already have and, and what's been posted in the uh, chat. Um, I, I would say that uh, applications are a great way to make mathematics more human. Of course, there are famous mathematicians throughout history, which you can talk about, but they might still feel a little bit removed from what's uh, real life. And if you look at the common core standards or something like that, it, it seems like mathematics is this self-contained abstract language, when in fact, there are people at Disney World designing roller coasters using calculus, or there are statisticians doing the US census using mathematics, um, or uh, there are uh, deep sea divers who need to know about sort of rate of ascent to, uh, to avoid decompression sickness. So there are so many really fascinating stories for every topic that students might be interested in, from sort of baseballs following a parabolic path or, or uh, sports, astronomy, everything really. So we should use these uh, super exciting stories to make mathematics more human and more uh, more engaging for uh, for students. And one sort of completely different thing is that the way the curriculum design is designed at the moment is pretty linear and not very personalized. So every student does algebra, then geometry, then uh, trigonometry, then calculus, and so on. And more than any other subject it is easy to, to sort of uh, not understand what's going on if you missed something that happened previously so I think we need to think much more about personalizing the curriculum so that students learn about topics that they are interested in at the pace they uh, they are able to understand them and not sort of leave people behind while we progress through the curriculum Hmm. Yeah, if I was going to go and think about what, what might be the things that are the biggest enablers or, or, or blockers of somebody being good at math, I actually think that confidence is a huge part of it. I mean, and that, that's actually going all the way back to some of these earlier comments that were made by Pamela and, and Laurie and so on. Uh, because if you think about what math is, I, I, I started thinking about this after we had kids. So I saw my kids learning in different subjects. And math was this unique subject where you could just be wrong. <laughs> what, I, what I mean is that if you do something, it's like, it's wrong. It's just wrong. I mean, I'm not saying that you're painting 
can you can paint anything you want. But in general, if you're sort of there, you, you're sort of got something, and it's, it's, it's a decent job you painted something. But with math, if you go and say that two plus two equals five, it's not it's not close enough. It's just no, it's not five. And so there's a certain thing where I I, I guess I noticed that somehow. Math is something where one could lose confidence very quickly. And in fact, math problems could go get harder and harder and eventually take real analysis. And like all of these things, they get really, really hard. And whenever I was doing math, it was also that you'd be doing things that were very, very difficult. And furthermore, you would consistently be wrong, wrong or unsuccessful. And there was no other way out. And having the confidence to proceed was actually what made a lot of difference. And so I, when I look at what causes people to have confidence, that's actually also getting back to some of these earlier comments too. Actually, I want to directly address, there was a comment made by somebody in the chat, which I think was somewhat in, inappropriate, like very inappropriate. But I, I also will say that um, the reason why I think it's, it's, it's very, I mean, this was some, somewhat earlier, but I, the reason why I think that all, all of these questions of, um, of background and, and whether or not you see other examples, these are directly uh, examples of people who maybe look like you. The reason why this is relevant is because those help people to have the confidence that you know they can do it. I'll give one example. My dad is a mathematician. Well, he's a statistician, but that's, that's the same thing, right? But so if you see somebody like that, then you say, well, okay, if my dad does it, I guess I could do it too. And just that, that very simple thing, that's why I have an advantage. It's like I saw from an early age, this is what a person does and they eat the normal stuff. Actually, I, I eat the same thing as them, right? This like it's normal stuff so if they can do it i can do it too i also have a younger brother my younger brother is a super genius um one one reason that he's a super genius is probably he said well if my older brother can do that stuff and when i say super genius i mean whatever i did he did better but I'm, I'm pretty sure his attitude was when he went and saw what i was doing well if i could do it so could he and so that's why what i'm trying to say is that um, I think there's a lot of value in trying to boost confidence. And I'll even give another example from later in my life when I became a math professor at Carnegie Mellon. When I first got there, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I wasn't sure I should be there. Like, why am I a professor here? Uh, there are so many smarter people that I ever, that I ever had, had to meet before. Um, but then at some point, a few months into my work at Carnegie Mellon, one of my senior colleagues told me, hey, you know, if you just keep doing what you're doing, you're going to make it. And that one comment had a huge impact because before that I was always thinking, I'm not sure but I belong here. I know so many smarter people in mathematics. You guys, <laughs> you accidentally hired me. I hope I can do a decent job. That's how I felt. But, but having that level of confidence helped a lot. And so I'll say, I'm just saying this because I know there's a bunch of people here who are also educators in some form. Um, one thing I always like to do when I see students is I try to give them that confidence because if, if, if somebody can have the confidence, that's what they need to get through the mental sticking point because math is hard. And because math is hard, everyone's gonna have sticking points. We have to have that when they get to the sticking points, they think they can bust through because if they don't think they can bust through, they will give up. And so that's, that's, that's my take on this. Awesome. And these are wonderful points that you guys brought up and some things that I've struggled with personally in my, um, pursuits of math. Um, and I guess as a final question uh, before we address some um, um, sorry, Q &A. Uh, Sorry, Maya, to interrupt, but is it okay if I answer another question from, uh, from the chat? Yes, go ahead. So, and, and maybe some of the other panelists also have ideas, but Nadine asked, how can we help teenagers who had a very found, a weak foundation in, uh, in their math education, maybe in primary school, and they are I assume much older now and the school doesn't have the resources to give them a personal tutor um, to teach at their pace. And um, I don't really have a solution for that uh, that works at the moment, but in my ideal scenario, I would say that there's a lot of mathematics that doesn't have any prerequisites. And uh, uh, sort of, I, I mentioned non-Euclidean geometry before. I don't think that's necessarily more difficult than uh, sort of uh, two column proofs in Euclidean geometry. It's just something completely different. And I've, I've taught the Königsberg bridges problem, which is in graph theory. Can you draw a path that crosses every bridge in a city without crossing them twice? I've taught that to um, primary school students who were seven or eight years old. I've taught that to high school students who were 17 years old at a sort of pretty similar level. And you don't need multiplication tables for that. You don't need algebra for that. But it's still valid mathematics and it teaches about problem solving and, and uh, creativity and uh, curiosity and so on and, and how to structure proofs and uh, reason logically. So I think it definitely helps to think about mathematics, not just as geometry and algebra to, um, to help students who have gaps in their prerequisites. 
Can I follow up with that? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, my mathematical skills when I started college were actually um, not, not very good. Um, and one of the things that I did is I started at community college and most of the community colleges tend to be very affordable. There's many in the area if you're in the United States and they usually can provide students, even if they haven't you know, completed high school, most community colleges also have G, uh, GED programs. And so there are classes at night that are offered. And so there are ways that are very, very affordable to take advantage of your community college resources. Because it might be, you're right, you know, this, this particular teenager might not be able to like start ninth grade again, that's not gonna fly, but they could go in the afternoon, in the evening to a community college course, very affordable, the books are, are pretty cheap or maybe all the material is gonna be online. And so I would say take advantage of the resources that community colleges do provide. I am a product of a community college and I've done quite well. So, you know, please, please, please utilize those resources. And I'll chime in. I, uh, it, it might sound simple, but it is effective. I've worked with some adults who really didn't feel comfortable with their foundation of math, but I feel like we're in a time where we're freeing people to think about the mathematics and that there's not just one correct way to solve it. They can think about multiple ways. And so just open it up for them to make sense of, like I said, the context of it, put it on a context and let and study different ways to solve it. Freeze, they freed those adults. They came in like, oh, I don't like math. And, and then when they found out, oh, I don't have to do it the way someone else said do it. Because as a classroom teacher, uh, I used to hear students say, I don't get it. And I was like, I would try to explain it again loud back when the, back in the day when we used to tell them exactly how to do it the way we're thinking. And when I freed it up for when I when they would say, I don't get it, I finally realized what that really meant. I don't get the way you're doing it. But in most cases, if you put it in a context, like I said, with life and say, how would you solve this? There are great problem solvers out there. Maybe they can't do it in the boxed way that they were taught, but they can and they they do know math. I think that conversation has to happen and really, I guess, building up their confidence that mathematics isn't this no nonsense <laughs> uh, subject. So just start the you know conversation, free them to think freely about the mathematics, I think would be a great start. All right, so um, addressing, I, I guess we'll just like totally pivot to uh, the chat now. So um, addressing a question that was um, brought up uh, quite a bit earlier. Um, someone asked, I feel like maths and our interaction with maths in post-education for real life is changing a lot. Is current maths education still providing what is needed or is it outdated somehow? Are we going around in a circle again or? Uh... I was just gonna ask, <laughs> yeah. I kind of want to start every time. Yeah, anyone could chime in at this point because it's not a direct question. Well, one thing I would definitely say is beyond the topics and problem solving skills and everything I mentioned before, if all you do is study mathematics at school and do the exams, it's very easy to think that every problem in life has a very defined question. It has a very defined answer that is usually a number or an equation. And you just happen to have all of the knowledge to solve that specific problem. And uh, that's sort of what you get in exam questions or diagnostic problems and, and sort of uh, homework exercises. But that's not at all what, uh, what real life is like. So in most cases, you have to come up with the question yourself and, and understand what you really want to work out. And I think Poe mentioned that before. Um, in uh, many cases, you don't have all of the tools and resources and knowledge to solve that problem. So you have to do research. Maybe you have to simplify the problem or, or try to solve it in a completely different way. Um, and maybe there is no solution. And that happens sort of at uh, PhD level mathematics, but also uh, for every real life problem. And in that case, maybe you have to make simplifications or, or sort of try to solve something else. And uh, I think that is uh, this process of coming up with problems and solving them is just as important as what we teach in mathematics at the moment. And that's definitely something that's missing from the curriculum at the moment. 
Um, the reason is that it's very difficult to examine in standardized exams. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have an easy solution for that at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, go ahead. You could check. Oh, okay. okay. But I, I, thought, I thought Pamela was going to say something. So I, I wasn't sure. I paused for a moment and it sounded like you were coming in. But okay, I'll, I'll come in. So, so um, I, I mean, I've thought a lot about this thing because uh, although I, I care very much about trying to help everybody get into mathematics, that's one of the very important pieces. Another thing is I've also thought about whether things should change because we now have the internet. What do I mean? It's because the, the way that the textbooks were written uh, was, if you look at a textbook, you often will see that the beginning part of it is effectively reviewing the last part of the last year or reviewing the last year actually. And that's because of the summer slide. But now we have a strange situation where some people, maybe because they have online resources, some people have access and then they're trying to, trying to do more. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that somehow with the way that the, the education system was built, that was pre-resources, pre pre-resources on the internet. And so I've often thought if there is a way to integrate both the, the free resources on the internet together with the way that we're learning, we might actually be able to learn more. Uh, and, and that's because we don't have a situation where um, there's just no school for three months. Now, uh, I, I don't know what the, what the correct answer to this is, but, but as, I, as I thought about it, one of the things that I've done is, uh, is for, for, for people who maybe want to push themselves harder, I actually, do, I actually did spend quite a bit of time thinking, how might, if I, if I wanted to teach somebody who wanted to really spend a lot of time doing math, how might I try to organize the curriculum? And then at that point, I ended up coming up with some things that are quite similar to what Philip was working on, uh, where, where, whereby one picks other kinds of topics uh, to teach, maybe even in middle school. Um, because I actually, my background from middle school was I played in these middle school math competitions. One of them was called Math Counts. And by playing in Math Counts, what I found out was that you could learn algebra, you could learn geometry, but you could actually also learn some elements of number theory. You could learn some elements of combinatorics and some elements of probability. But all of those were all taught at like pretty basic levels, but that was enough to make math rich. So actually what I spent some time doing, that was a year ago or so, was I spent time thinking, you know, if you could actually re-architect how you might try to teach um, say a middle school student who's already already fairly advanced in the sense that they, they kind of understand what's going on in school, what might you want to do to put together a richer curriculum? Then the answer is you can actually put a lot in there. Um, and that's actually why eventually I, I came to this point of, okay, so it's possible to do that. Then is it also possible to inspire people to want to go and play with these things? Because actually, even though I made some comment about non-Euclidean geometry, all that stuff is fun. And so, so somehow if we can find a way to also show people the fun part where they spend maybe less time just going over the routine pieces, then that, that would actually be quite valuable. And so in the end, I guess the way I see math education is it's a very wide spectrum of different interventions at different times. Um, but in light of the fact that we have the internet around now, it's actually, it's actually possible maybe to stretch further. This makes me think a little bit about the fact that we've said certain words in describing mathematics. We've talked about creativity. You know, I usually describe it as beautiful. We've made connections to art. Um, but the assessment piece, which we've also talked about, we've said the word standardized testing multiple times. And so I, I'd love to hear more from you guys about this. I have some ideas, but how do we merge the two? Like, how do we end up if, if we as math educators believe that creativity and seeing the beauty in mathematics is valuable to actually give students like a rich experience in the mathematical process, how do we rethink curriculums so that they are assessing those things? And I think that's the part that I struggle with a lot, right? And so I have some ideas of what I've done, but I'm so eager to hear from you guys. I, I want to jump in. I love this question. So I think this is really, really, really interesting. And it actually gets to somebody made a comment about a two plus two equals five in the chat also. So I should say, like, just the way that the way that I've approached teaching is oftentimes I'll say, you know, we want to learn how to do this kind of problem. And I'll have some idea of how I want to teach that. Not how, how, not how I want to teach it, how I would do it. But I say, hey, everyone, we're going to do this. Anyone got ideas? And then at that point, I usually find out that the students come up with some crazy way of solving it, which I never thought of before. And it might be highly inefficient, but I would usually celebrate the fact that, wow, you actually came up with all of these crazy ways and it worked. And then after they did it, I'd say, anyone have any other solutions? But the point is just, you know, if we're thinking about 
how you want to how you want to get creativity in. Creativity comes actually in seeing many ways to solve the same problem. And actually, something that's super circuitous can also be beautiful because, like, who would have thought you could run through that other thing to go back there? So, I guess to me, I think that when I think of how I think math is beautiful, I think also of how some people say, wow, that was a beautiful shot if you think of sports. It's like, how would you ever have thought of banking that basketball off of? I guess, I don't know what else you bank it off, but that was a terrible example. It was only a backboard. But I mean, I'm thinking of like, there's a soccer kick where some guy like flipped over a head and did a backwards kick. And it's like, how did you do that? That's beautiful. And that's actually the same way that I feel sometimes when I see a student came up with some way of doing a math problem. Wonderful, yeah. Um, I think we, again, uh, Philip, would you like to add on? Um, just uh, very quickly, so, many other subjects are already doing that. So I don't think we have to start from scratch in mathematics. You have uh, grades in music and art, obviously, but also in subjects like um, geography and history and, and biology and, and other sciences, where you actually do have to use a little bit of mathematics to solve problems. And I think we should really focus on these cross subject connections between mathematics and other subjects so that we can maybe add some more mathematics to all of the other subjects um, and, and use their existing uh, infrastructure in terms of curriculum and exam and, and just have students use the skills they learn in mathematics to solve those uh, more interesting, more creative, more applied problems. I don't have any more to add. I think they've covered it and, and it's just a matter of starting the conversation, the collaboration and, and, and working on, on that. You know, So we don't have solid answers, but this is something that we'll explore going forward. Yeah, and I, I do think the points addressed are incredibly important, but I feel like um, a lot of them are very abstract and um, they seem to lack a certain connection into, you know, applying them directly um, and, and in certain cases. Um, but I guess even if they're small steps, what do you think would be the next step for educators to improve math education um, in schools and universities? So I think I've said mine a few times, right? But I, I think really uh, leveraging some online resources, for example, the website I helped co-found, so latisons.org, or also its sister website, Mathematically Gifted and Black, to feature different mathematicians that your students might not have encountered before. I think that that part can really enrich the learning environment for students. And then again, they can see themselves reflected in these positions. And when you see yourself in those careers, you might decide that that could be a career for you. And so if we're thinking about, um, you know, building confidence in our students, as was mentioned earlier, helping them thrive in these fields, um, that could be one way in which uh, there's really very small buy-in, you know, there's, there's not a lot that you need to do, but just be cognizant and implement a little bit of changes in that regard can really pay lots of dividends. Yes, and go to the extent of celebrating the individuals, the people, having confidence in them, looking for their strengths. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in assessments and we're using that to divide students, separate students, uh, track students, looking at the negatives. We need to look at, at what their strengths are, what they can do, not what they can't do. We need to have more higher expectations for students. We need to not, you know, I used to have this thing, if, you, if your expectations are here, students will reach here. If your expectations are here, students will reach here. So we need to set expectations and not limits on people and, and not look at a person and say, well, they can't do that. So I'm not gonna stretch them to that point. So um, we just need to go at it at a, on, a, on a positive level, not uh, looking for what's missing. Yeah, I, I don't think I can give you a sort of single thing that uh, educators should do next to, to improve math education. There are so many different things that are all equally valid and all equally important. I can just say, say sort of personally what I'm working on with Mathigon at the moment is to try to make online education more interactive. So that rather than watching a 10 minute video and then answering multiple choice questions afterwards, students can explore and discover and be creative and hopefully try to learn in a much more active and engaging way. 
yeah, maybe I'll just I'll just close out by maybe making a comment, uh, echoing, uh, elevating a comment that Justin Hancock put up, which is about continuing the sports metaphor. And I actually do feel the same way. It's like somehow um, basketball players do need to have strong basic skills to play well, but you don't require them to spend years just dribbling and doing free throws before starting to play the game. Um, calling it play the game is actually something that's very valuable. That's actually why the way that I try to teach my classes is I try to say, here, let's all try to solve this together and see how we solve this together. I think it'd be really interesting to uh, see if we could try to do that at, at other scales. And I'll say that's not how I started teaching. When I first started teaching, I made a lesson plan. And the lesson plan, and it's not that you shouldn't make lesson plans, you should make lesson plans. But my first time I started teaching, I knew exactly what I was going to write down. And I was going to say, I'm going to write this down, I'm going to say this, I'm going to write this down, I'm going to say this. I did that for a few years. And then after a while, I started doing a different teaching style, which was, hey, let's try to do this. What do you think? And actually, sometimes the students would say things that I don't know. And that's how I started to learn how it's okay, not learn is okay, but I would learn how to be in the board and say, I didn't know that before. And now, I, at first, I thought that was not allowed, right? I'm the teacher, I'm supposed to know everything. But I started to get used to sometimes saying, I actually didn't know that was true. Why is that true? But by being willing to do that, it made me willing to take more risks and it made the learning much more fun. And I, I will say, I've learned so many things from my students now. I've learned, I learned one neat thing, which is if you take Pascal's triangle, like the one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, if you just erase all of the even numbers, it turns out you get a picture that looks like Sierpinski's triangle, it's a fractal. I learned things like if you take one over 89 and you put it into a calculator, it's 0 0.011235. Oh my goodness, it's the Fibonacci's, sort of. There's something deeper there, but I won't, I won't go deeper into it right now. But these are all things that I learned while I was teaching some class and the students said, yeah, don't you know, we use this thing. And I'd say, I didn't know that was true. But I, I, just, I just wanted to share like somehow, uh, once I started playing the game as well with the students and also sometimes saying, I, I actually don't know, let's go and try to figure it out. It made my teaching style much different. And I think it also helped students to see that you could, you could do problems in any way. I, I said this publicly just here because I think that sometimes people do expect that teachers are never supposed to say, I don't know. And I'm gonna tell you, I say, I don't know quite often. Uh, I say, I didn't know that. Let's see. Can you explain to me why? I mean, uh, oftentimes the way, I, one over, no, not one over 40. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, somebody else is saying another fun one. But what, what I'm trying to say is like, I'm just trying to publicly make this statement that, you know, if we can make it so teachers are allowed to say, I don't know in the classroom, we might be able to see much more interesting teaching. Uh, I'm just going to make that comment, right? It's like somehow if we hold that everything the teachers say is supposed to be 100% correct, well, then you're not going to get something very interesting. But if people are allowed to say, I don't know, let's go figure it out. Uh, then suddenly the teacher is involved. It's, it's, it suddenly becomes like the whole class is working together, even the teacher. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that little comment. Yeah, we have, we've had moments where, you know, it's okay for the teacher to not immediately have a response or reaction. And, you know, we had a student one time who solved a problem and got the correct solution. We just couldn't understand their strategy. And we were like, wow, you've blown our minds. Can you give us overnight to think about this? We want to dig deeper into your strategy. And that really elevated that student's confidence. And so it's okay to not take care of things in that moment. Great. Um, and I think that will conclude our discussion tonight. Uh, thank you panelists for your incredible insight. Um, we'll be sending out um, a follow-up email with the link shared today, um, as well as the recording of the panel. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed this discussion and we'll explore some of the strategies discussed today um, on your own time to enrich both your own mathematical education or that group of students. Um, and thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks.